Hello folks and welcome back to another ranking all video here on the channel and today we're going to rank all full length studio albums from Flotsam and Jetsam. These guys they were from Phoenix Arizona and they've been at it for almost 4 years now releasing a total of 14 studio albums or 15 if you count the re-recorded version of No Place for Disgrace. And for those who aren't that deep into metal, Flotsam and Jetsam are perhaps best known for being the former band of Jason Newsted of Metallica fame. So today we're going to go through their full discography, but before we do that, make sure that you guys smash that like button and subscribe with the bell notifications turned on, so you won't miss out on future uploads here on the channel. And now it's time for us to rank Flotsam and Jetsam's full discography. In 14th place, Vema Natural Selection from 1999. And for me, this is their worst album, because it feels so much like a product of its time. It has that 90s dry and heavy tone to it, that Pantera and Machine and sound that everyone wanted to replicate. And music wise, Flotsam and Jetsam fell into that as well, even if they had a much more melodic side to them that those other bands perhaps didn't. And this was also the band's first album without original guitarist Michael Gelbert and original drummer Caddy David Smith, and they've been replaced by Mark T. Simpson and Craig Nielsen. There are a few riffs on this record that I do enjoy, like in the songs Dreamscape or Promise Keepers, which I think is the best song of the record. And I've had this album since it came out, so I do perhaps like it more for nostalgic reasons. So if you're a thrash metal fan and have no relations to this record, then I'll suggest that you start elsewhere, because this album hasn't aged that well, and I also think it's their most groove metal sounding album. A Natural Selection is a record that tried to surf the trends of the 90s, and that makes it sound dated and quite irrelevant today, unless you prefer that 90s sound. Next. In 13th place we have Dreams of Death from 2005, and the album title was also a song from their 1988 album No Place for Disgrace. The idea behind Dreams of Death was to create songs from Eric A.K.'s collected dreams or nightmares I should perhaps say. But if you slept on this record, well, then you haven't missed that much, even though there was a bit of a hype for this album when it came out, but it never really spoke to me. There's just something about this album that feels off for me. Maybe it's the production, maybe it's the rather uninteresting songwriting, or maybe it's a combination of both. I just find Dreams of Death to be a rather dull and boring snooze fest. Next. In 12th place we have Ugly Noise from 2012, and around the time of the release of this record, I was a bit burned out on the band. I did listen to the new album when it came out, because I will always check up on these guys whenever they put out something new, but I kind of moved on from this record pretty quickly, so this is probably the flotsam album that I've listened to the least. And out of the band's last handful of records, this one is their least thrashy I think. It's more in the mid-tempo style of their mid-90s records, but with a more contemporary production of course. Maybe it's a bit of a stretch to call this a rock album, but there are some songs here that feels more like 90s rock than metal. Like with the piano parts of Ugly Noise, or even the Yiddish sounding synthesizers of Run and Hide. So if you're strictly into metal, then I think you can skip this one. But if you enjoy some alternative rock from time to time, then you might enjoy this a bit more. Still, I think it's one of the weakest albums. And it's also worth noting that this was the band's last album to feature David Kelly Smith, who left the band to focus more on his family. This was also where guitarist Ed Carlson departed from the band. They did however both appear on the re-recorded version of No Place for Disgrace. So the band's future was a bit uncertain at the time. Next. In 11th place when My God from 2001. And I remember when I first heard this record. It was the song Dig Me Up To Burn Me, and it blew my mind. I thought it was so cool to hear such a thrashy song from them again. But the rest of the record didn't impress me that much. It was more of that 90s kinda heavy rock riffing on a lot of these songs, with lots of acoustic parts and such. 
so this is still very much in that modern rock slash metal style. So I wouldn't say that this is more than an average release from Flotsam and Jetsam. And after the release of My God, vocalist Eric A.K. announced his departure from the band because he wanted to focus more on a country music project. So that was devastating news at the time, but fortunately Eric came to his senses and returned to the band the following year. Next. In 10th place we have High from 1997, and as I briefly mentioned earlier, the 90s period of Flotsam and Jetsam differs quite a bit from the early days, and the more recent albums too. The band went for a more mid-tempo sound during the 90s, and I think it was inspired a bit by that Seattle grunge sound. High was one of those albums that I listened to quite a bit in the late 90s and early 2000s, because I got a handful of their albums for just a few bucks, so I picked them all up at once, and at the time I was quite into Flotsam, so this is one of those albums that I do like perhaps more for nostalgic reasons than for how good it really is. And there is a bit of that early 90s post thrash sound here, think Metallica's Black Album or Megadeth's mid to late 90s records. And this song's Final Step and Hallucinational are two songs that are worth checking out if you haven't heard this one, or Monster, which they recorded the music video for. Next. In ninth place we have The Cold, and this was one of those albums that I didn't listen to that much when it came out, simply because I found other music that spoke more to me than Flotsam did as a band at the moment. I did however take notice of the song Better Off Dead, a rather depressive ballad that reminded me a lot of albums like Quattro and Drift for example. And I think it's a good song, but the rest of the album is more of a metallic one I would say. And the hype for Flotsam and Jetsam grew quite a bit during this time period. When I first got into them in the late 90s they were more or less considered dead creatively. Or just a sellout band that did ballads and weird stuff like that. And I think that Dreams of Death and The Cold made the metal crowds more interested in the band again. Even if the general consensus was that the first two records were great and everything after that was kinda lame. But I think that The Cold was an alright album, but I still put it on the lower half of their discography. Next. In 8th place we have Drift. And this album is a rather odd one. I could definitely have ranked this as the worst, simply because it's the band's softest record, but here it sits at 8th place. And there is a lot of acoustic arrangements here, like in the songs Pick a Window or Destructive Signs. And I would say that there is an overall mid 90s alternative rock sound to this record. So I think that Flotsam sounded like a completely different band here in comparison to their first two records. But on the other hand, the songwriting on this album is better than the songwriting on some of their more metallic sounding albums that I rank lower than this one. But if you're a strict metalhead, then I must warn you about this record, even if it at times reminds me a bit of Death Angels Act 3, which was also a mix of acoustic ballads and heavier songs. And I think if you're into early 90s Metallica, or even Soundgarden and Alice in Chains, then you would most likely love this record too. The songs Empty Air and Picky Window are worth investigating if you're curious to hear more from Drift. Next. In 7th place we have the band's 4th studio record Quattro, and I think that this is the album that bridges the gap between those weirder 90s alternative metal sounding records with the thrasher sound of the band's third studio record When the Storm Comes Down. But uh, this album has a way more depressive tone to it than that album though. Especially with songs like Wading Through the Darkness, The Message or Swarting It Flies. And I wasn't a fan of the band when this record came out in 92, but my guess is that it got similar reactions to Megadeth's Countdown to Extinction, Anthrax, Sound of White Noise, or even Metallica's The Black Album. Because this was a shift in the band's direction, but it's still a metal album though. And just like on Drift, the songwriting here is great, but I'm not sure about the direction that the band took here, but I don't blame them that much either. Because more or less every thrash band of the 80s slowed down in the early 90s to be able to survive as a band. 
Don't get me wrong though, Quattro is a good album for what it is, and I think it's definitely worth checking out if you can handle some melodic mid-tempo stuff. But on the other hand, don't expect this to be in the style of Doomsday for the Deceiver. Next. In sixth place, we have the band's self-titled 2016 album Flotsam and Jetsam. And this one came like a total surprise to me. Because their last couple of albums had been good, but nothing spectacular. And then they released this album, and it was such a thrash assault I just couldn't believe my ears. I had been a fan of the band for the last 20 years at the time, so I didn't expect them to ever embrace their thrash past like this. The song Iron Maiden, for example, it totally blew my mind. I think it was the best song that the band had written since 1988. It was fast and speedy, kinda like Iron Maiden on steroids. The band, that is, even if the song itself is about the torture device. Also worth mentioning here is the drummer Jason Bittner. I really think he was a great addition to the band, but unfortunately for the Flotsam camp, he left to join Overkill after just recording this album. But overall, the band's self-titled album was a great comeback to form, and an album that I recommend that you guys check out. So, next. In fifth place for the band's latest studio album to date, which is Blood in the Water that came out last year. And ever since the band put out their self-titled Flotsam and Jetsam record in 2016, Flotsam has finally fully come around and kinda ditched the more rock-oriented sound that they cultivated in various forms ever since Quattro came out in 92. And these guys are so talented musicians, so whenever they decide to thrash, they always deliver on the absolute highest level. And I saw this album on top of many album of the year lists from last year. And I do agree, it's probably in my top 10 as well, if I would go on and make a top 10 list of the best albums from 2021. And they also made a music video for the track Brace for Impact, a good and speedy song that are worth checking out, but I would say that the whole album is very consistent. So, next. In fourth place, we have the end of Chaos from 2019, and yikes, this is such a ferocious and fast record. It might just be the most extreme record that the band has ever put out, and I certainly do like that. Just listen to the track Control, it's absolutely marvelous and frenetic. Demolition Man and Prisoner of Time are two other songs that I really do enjoy also. And I thought that drummer Jason Bittner, who played on the band's previous record, was a great addition to the band. So I was a bit worried that they would go back to that softer flotsam sound after he left the band to join Overkill, but Ken Mary stepped in and I think he delivered, so it worked out just fine. And I hold The End of Chaos, the self-titled Flotsam and Jetsam record, and Blood in the Water as three similar albums in terms of quality and style. I consider these three albums to be the band's full comeback to Thrash. Next. In third place, we have the band's third studio album, When the Storm Comes Down, from 1990. And I think that this is a rather underrated record. Usually people only talk about their first two albums, and they rarely even mention the third. Sure, it's not a masterpiece like the first two, but it's definitely a record worth investigating further if you never heard it. And this album is a bit heavier and more in the mid-tempo region than the band's first two albums. And it sounds kinda like Metallica's and Justice For All, but with an audible bass of course. And my favorite tracks here are The Master Sleeps, Suffer the Masses, and 666. That one reminds me a bit of the aforementioned Metallica, or Testament. Melodic and powerful mid-tempo thrash. So I think that When the Storm Comes Down is one of their best records. Next. In second place, we have no place for Disgrace from 1988. After their excellent debut album, Flotsam and Jetsam were signed to Elektra, where they became label mates with Metallica. So it looked like Flotsam and Jetsam were close to their big mainstream breakthrough, but somehow it was never fully realized. And after this record, they were also dumped by the label. And before recording this album, the band's bassist Jason Newsted was recruited to replace Cliff Burton in Metallica. So Flotsam and Jetsam recruited Troy Gregory to fill in on the bass. 
And uh, No Place for Disgrace has been one of my favorite records ever since I first heard it. I think this album has it all. Excellent singing, fast driving riffs, but it also has a melodic side to it. Like in the song Escape from Within, which is one of the best thrash ballads of all time. If there is even such a thing. Other songs that I love includes No Place for Disgrace, Dreams of Death, and I Live You Die. And they also covered Elton John in Saturday Night's Alright for Fighting. So if you like melodic and crunchy thrash with great vocals, look no further, because No Place for Disgrace is a masterpiece. Next. My favorite Flotsam and Jetsam record is their 1986 debut album Doomsday for the Deceiver. And I hold this slightly higher than No Place for Disgrace, simply because it has less filler material and fewer ballads. This album is leaning towards the speed metal region, or perhaps power thrash, more than pretty much everything that they did after it. And Doomsday for the Deceiver is amongst the best metal albums of all time. I really hold it that high. It's probably in my top 20 or something. Metal fans in general like to talk about the fact that Jason Newsted played the bass on this record. And he sure did, but I don't think that their ties with Metallica is what made this album great or anything. But I do think that this was the best metal album that he ever appeared on, even if this record didn't sell near as well as Justice or The Black Album for example. Jason was one of the main songwriters here and his bass work is surely excellent, but I must press that this was a team effort. Eric A.K. is one of the best melodic singers in Thrash, and I absolutely love it when he uses his falsetto. And we shouldn't forget about Ed Carlson and Michael Gilbert, they are an excellent guitar duo that brings the speed and the crunch without ever losing their melodic edge. Heck, let's even throw in drummer Kelly David Smith here too, because they all deserve some cred for this fantastic record. I mean songs like Hammerhead, Desecrator, Metal Shark, she took an axe, there are so many superb songs on this album that it's almost getting ridiculous. This is surely one of the best thrash metal records of all time, so I hope that everyone who is watching this video have at least heard the album, and if not then you're in for a real treat. But there is one thing that boggles me about this record. Why? Why is Flotzilla teabagging Satan? I guess some things are best left untold. And now it's time for us to check out the full Flotsam and Jetsam rank, and the first three here are in chronological order, and after that the band went in a softer direction. But with the last three releases, Flotsam and Jetsam have stepped things up again, and I've noticed a bigger interest for their music in more recent years across the board. Maybe they have finally gotten the respect that I always thought that they deserved. Sure, they had a softer period, but even through that period, they managed to write great songs. And Eric A.K., what a great singer he is. He's surely one of the best thrash metal vocalists of all time, even if his style is more in the old-school metal tradition than the typical barking, gruffy thrash style. And these guys were one of my absolute favorite bands some 20 years ago, and I still love and respect them till this day even their less popular mid-90s albums. But now I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. What's your favorite Flotsam and Jetsam record? And if you're familiar with most of their work, feel free to rank their albums down below. And don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel with the bell notifications turned on so you won't miss out on future Rank em All videos. And if you enjoy my work, then there's always the option to support the Metal Madness by grabbing a shirt or a hoodie from the Ruthless Metal Store, or by becoming a patron like the Horseman of the Apocalypse. And I'm also on Discord, Instagram, Facebook and Spotify, and you can find all my links listed down below. And that's all for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye bye. <laughs>